All right, welcome everyone to today's session, Supporting Classroom Instruction with Teach Britannica. My name is Chris Heinz. I'm the Director of Customer Experience here at Britannica Education. Uh, I've been with Britannica for about three years now. Uh, my background is as a high school social studies teacher, so I know that this is a, a shorter session today. Um, but as a social studies teacher, I tend to go off on tangents and anecdotes. So Christy will try to rein me in and make sure that I keep us within our time frame today. Um, but Christy Bengali is joining me on the call as well. Christy, I'll let you talk about yourself for a little bit too. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Christy Bengali. I'm the Curriculum Learning Specialist here at Brit Britannica. Um, I am also a former classroom teacher. Middle school is my love and my passion. So I'm excited to bring that to you today with some resources um, at our middle school level. But yeah, I'm really excited to get this webinar started. Awesome. Well, thank you, Christy. So um, as I mentioned, we will be talking today about Teach Britannica. So this is the newest, the latest and greatest resource from the Britannica education team. Um, and this is really about supporting classroom instruction. So one of the things that we've heard from folks is that our partners in the library, um, library media specialists, know Britannica really well, use Britannica very often. Uh, but a lot of times where our school district state partners struggle is classroom implementation, right? And, and folks that are in the classroom every day don't always see how this nonfiction text from Britannica and, and other resources that we offer, don't always see how that can be integrated into the classroom. Um, so Teach Britannica has been built to really help solve for that and make it really easy and seamless for teachers to integrate Britannica resources into their classroom instruction. So we will go piece by piece and talk about kind of how this can be used um, as part of a really effective classroom in instruction. So for today's agenda, I'll talk a little bit about Britannica Education as a company. For those of you that uh, were not on our first webinar of the series here, we do like to start off by talking a little bit about Britannica and what we stand for. Um, I'm going to ask for some participation in the chat as well. Um, so I do want to hear from you and kind of what your classroom priorities are. We'll have some some areas where I will stop and, and ask for participation in the chat. So I would just ask, uh, please feel free to share widely uh, your comments, feedback, concerns as well. Um, and then finally, we'll have some action items and next steps. Uh, we'll go through some worked examples of Teach Britannica content as well. Um, so you can see how this can be used in the classroom. So Britannica Education, um, and I didn't do our trivia session today. Sometimes I like to lead off by asking folks uh, some trivia questions about Britannica, but I will spoil the lead here and say that Britannica has been around for a very long time. Uh, first Encyclopedia Britannica was published in 1768. Um, I actually have a replica of the first edition sitting on my bookshelf next to my desk over here, um, and it was three volumes, and that was quote unquote, all of the knowledge in the world up to that point. Um, we've expanded, right? So our, our Britannica team has really worked to expand into the classroom. Our purpose as a company is to really help to empower educators to create meaningful learning experiences that invite, ignite curiosity in their students. So we do this through our diverse collection of digital solutions. Some of you may have Britannica School, Britannica Library, ImageQuest, any of our other uh, resources, but are really built to kind of fill needs in the education space. Uh, we have what we like to consider um, second to none customer support, where our team is really working to make sure that folks who subscribe to Britannica content have the training and support needed to get the most out of those resources. And then professional learning opportunities as well. So how can we help to extend beyond the resources um, and really help to make meaningful change in the classroom also? Um, so we're really dedicated to this. Our team has worked really hard uh, to build out these resources to, to help empower our educators, um, and we hope that that becomes apparent as we go through our session today. So I'm going to kick it over to Christy. She's going to talk a little bit about the development of Teach Britannica and kind of our guiding principles as well. Sure, and I think you're going to hear a lot of overlap in some of the core Britannica principles that, that Chris shared, which is great as we try and weave that through all of our solutions. Um, but to echo Chris's sentiments, Teach Britannica is our dedicated teacher resource hub 
designed to integrate our Britannica solutions into classrooms and daily instruction. And we believe um, we do that by offering a variety of easy to implement, time-saving, practical resources for teachers, which you're going to see today. Um, as you see here, Teach Britannica is grounded in five core design principles, and they're providing digital, non-digital options across all resource types, um, promoting student-centered learning, employing evidence-based practices, supporting professional learning and development, emphasizing our commitment to inclusive ed education. And you're gonna see that really woven throughout all of our, our resources. Um, we really feel that these five core principles and foundations are what truly enhance the teaching and learning experiences that we're able to provide for our teachers in all of our resources. But we challenge you to be those experts today as you get to explore some of these with us. Awesome, thank you, Christy. So let's go ahead and jump into our interactive piece here. And like I said, please feel free to communicate in the chat. Um, but I just wanna pause for a brief second here and just kind of ask you, what are your top three priorities when lesson planning? Um, if you're not in the classroom right now, try to think and, and put yourself in the shoes of the teachers that you work with and think about what are those priorities that folks have when they are lesson planning. So I'm going to go ahead and pause myself, uh, give everyone a break from hearing my voice for a second here um, and let these answers flow into the chat and then we'll we'll move forward. Awesome. Thank you, Christy. So we have standard alignment, relevance, engagement. I'm seeing content, evaluation, and feedback tools. Absolutely. All very important pieces of lesson planning. Uh, being able to hit several things at once, right? Making sure that, you know, you have multiple priorities and how can you have really high impact strategies that are going to do, you know, kind of check a bunch of boxes as well. How to engage students in the topic that I'm going to teach, how to trigger curiosity in students, how to design meaningful activities for students. So many hats that teachers wear. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yep. Setting the learning objective with learning outcomes, alignment to educational standards, bringing curiosity, activities, content planning, reflection. Give it another 15 seconds or so for folks to anyone else who wants to respond, but I think we've hit a lot. What do you think, Christy? Yeah, those are the key ones. I know when I was in the classroom trying to find a lot of time-saving um, ways to really prioritize the instruction going on in the classroom and managing mm -hmm. that with all of the administrative work that um, teachers are, are tasked with today as well. Yeah, absolutely. And probably, yeah, I like that. Planning is always two ways, planning forward and planning backwards, right? So working towards your goal, but then also working from that goal back, right? And and having that kind of, you know, give and take, right? Where you're you're understanding where you're trying to go, but then also being very thoughtful on the path that's going to lead you there as well. So thank you everyone for sharing. I think these are all, I mean, obviously great priorities. It's a lot for teachers to have on their plate. Um, and, and I know I asked for three and we probably listed off 12 to 15 different priorities depending on what classroom you're in or, or who you're working with. So Teach Britannica, if we throw this into this mix of, of priorities when lesson planning, um, Teach Britannica was really built to be very easy um, to captivate student attention, to streamline these lesson plans, um, to really provide these resources as easy to implement as possible. Um, so we're going to focus on three key uh, resource types today. 
The first are our lesson minis, the second are our instructional strategies, and the third are our graphic organizers. Um, I'm not gonna go into the Teach Britannica resource. Uh, you're more than welcome. I'll put the, the link in the chat again. Um, you're more than welcome to kind of explore teachbritannica.com um, and, and you know, find these resources for yourself as well. Um, but we will keep this in our, our slide deck today. Um, so we won't go into the live demo, but I will kind of go through each of these three resources for those of you that were not on the first session um, that we hosted last week. I'm not gonna read all of this text here, um, but just trust that with lesson minis, this content has been aligned to Britannica School. Um, these lesson minis are built for students in the early elementary, elementary, and middle school space, soon to come lesson minis for students in the high school space as well. Um, but they're really designed to be engaging activities, um, short activities that can be paired together or can be implemented independently um, that tie back to specific Britannica content. Um, and really focus on kind of real world extension activities. Um, I think these can be really useful as sub plans. Um, we have lesson minis uh, activities that are less than 20 minutes. Some are 20 to 30, 30 to 40 or 40 plus, um, really flexibly implemented within a, a classroom, um, classroom space and provides really all of the content a teacher needs, all of the uh, materials, the procedures, suggestions for differentiation, um, team teaching suggestions as well. Um, so I think these are really well built um, and we'll, we'll go through a few worked examples as well. Um, but again, very flexible, right? Differentiation and variation, collaborative teaching, um, and all of this content, we know that device fatigue is real. All of this content is printable, so it can be used both digitally, right? They're fillable PDF forms that you can share with students, or they can be printed off and used um, in, the, uh, in the classroom outside of a device as well. Christy, anything I missed with lesson minis that you would want to elaborate on? Um, no, I think actually Priya hit it really well. I, I think we captured a lot of what she was looking for there. Um, these are all listed with a specific learning objectives for each activity, the, the specific learning outcomes. They are aligned to our um, common uh, educational standards in, in the U.S., um, although they're not listed specifically on each activity, they were designed with standard alignment um, in mind for sure. Awesome. These are probably the, the most built resources, right? Like these are very, you know, procedure oriented, um, lots of templates, graphic organizers built in. Um, so they focus on specific Britannica content. The second resource I'll share are the instructional strategies, which are a little bit more flexible um, and tied to really kind of key topics, um, key skills, um, and use research backed methods to help support student learning in the classroom. Um, so within the instructional strategies, these are a little bit more broad. Uh, the example we have here is a close reading activity. We still have all of that content, right? When you would, you know, how long this would take, when you can do this, um, what materials you'll need. Um, but it's not tied back to articles in Britannica School or Britannica Library or any of our other resources. They're really designed to be implemented across different uh, curricular areas. Um, and this will be something in our next session where we focus on library um, programs. This will be something we really focus on the instructional strategies and also our graphic organizers as ways to really help to enhance those as well. So just a, a quick shameless plug for you to join us next Tuesday if you want to as well. Um, Christy, anything else to share about instructional strategies and how these were developed? Um, when you're in Teach Britannica and you're searching for instructional strategies on the main page, what I love is that we've subdivided them for you into six main um, category types, and you can also filter them by grade level. So um, if I am going on to Teach Britannica and I'm looking for a new activity on discussion and collaboration, I can actually filter through all of those 44 strategies that we have on there right now. Um, navigate down to my desired grade level and then look through the strategies that really meet the needs of, of what I'm looking for in that particular lesson that day. 
Um, and what I love is they're kind of a one-stop shop in that, um, you know, some teachers might like to print these off and leave them in a binder, but any sort of graphic organizer or organizational support that uh, corresponds with the instructional strategy is always linked and included in there uh, for you as well. Awesome. So yeah, really flexible, but also really targeted. Um, so really hitting on these kind of key themes and skills for students. Um, I did see a question here in the Q&A. <clears throat> is, is it possible? It is not impossible. Is it possible to use instructional strategies with universities? Um, you see that they're designed only for schools. I think absolutely. Um, I think that these skills are really universal. It's not, you know, even if they are kind of aligned to content in the K-12 space, um, I feel that they do really apply in the university space as well. Um, and you can see even, you know, close reading, we have, you know, citing textual evidence, we have um, kind of research-based strategies as well. I think all things that can be utilized in the university space also. Um, so I would say absolutely. Um, they, they can definitely apply across really a, a very wide range um, of student interest and, and student abilities as well. All right. Last resource to focus on here, graphic organizers. Um, so these are a very popular piece of what Britannica has offered in the past as well, as part of what some of you may remember as our asset library um, that had dozens of graphic organizers that were really used to kind of enhance classroom practice, enhance research skills, um, and really provide a nice visual representation of kind of complex uh, text as well. Um, Christy's probably tired of hearing this story, but I did a session once for um, a school district not too far from where I am in the Chicago area, and I accidentally showed the asset library at the beginning of the session. Uh, one of the, the library media specialists in the room, I don't think she heard a word I said for the rest of the session because she just was pointing and clicking and downloading every single one of the graphic organizers to her device. Uh, but when she left the session, she did say it was the best professional development that she had ever been a part of. So um, really popular piece, really flexible. Um, again, digital options, they're fillable PDF forms, but also printable. Um, so really, I think something that folks have have had success with and have really enjoyed in the past. Um, Christy, anything to share about our graphic organizers? I think that's great. Um, you'll, if you go on to Teach Britannica, one of my favorite things is that they are organized with PDF thumbnails. So you can see at a glance what the organizer looks like. And I think that's a really great time-saving strategy for teachers too, because oftentimes we go on, we know exactly what we have in mind um, and we can kind of quickly scroll through our list. I think we have quite a robust gallery right now. I think of over 70 graphic organizers. Um, and then from there, from that thumbnail view, you can actually click into the strategy, either type in it and, or download it and use it and share it. So um, really, really um, strategic thinking on how we share those out with you. Awesome. All right. So let's jump in. We've talked about this. Let's talk about how this all works. Uh, within the classroom. And we'll go through a couple different worked examples. We've pulled some lesson minis uh, from the elementary and the middle space. Um, and we'll just kind of walk through kind of what this can look like in the classroom. Um, so Christy, I think I turn it over to you to kind of walk through what this looks like at the elementary level. Um, and then we'll go through our worked example as well. Sure. So there's a bunch of lesson minis to choose from. Um, and as Chris mentioned earlier, lesson minis can be thought of as kind of um, a unit overview that have specific activities within on a, on a on a certain topic. So the one we're looking here right now is um, a lesson mini entitled Bringing History to Life with Biographies. The study of biographies is a very common unit in um, elementary grades three to five. So what you're seeing here um, first on the left is our overview tile. It'll give you um, the title of the lesson mini and then um, it, uh, an at a glance view of how many activities there are. Um, as Chris mentioned earlier, they can range from two activities to five activities um, and they can be used flexibly. I can start with activity five, I could start with activity one, 
I can go through and kind of sort and look at an activity that meets the needs most appropriately for my students. Um, so what you're looking at in the middle are our five activities for the bringing history to life um, with biographies. Um, and as a teacher, I can click in and see the learning objectives, the overview of what I'm exploring here. I can see that activity one is particular to historical figure biographies. Um, activity two focuses on explorer biographies. Three is more um, centralized around constitutional contributors. Activity four is on state pioneers, more state specific lens um, of historical figures. And then activity five is more of a culminating activity um, on a historical figure time capsule. So as I kind of click through and navigate through those activities, I can find the one that aligns best with my needs. I also get an overview of how long it will take. So as I'm clicking through, I'm going to say, for example, that activity five really speaks to me. It, it um, aligns well with the learning objectives that I want my students to accomplish during the class that day. Um, and as I go into that, I am presented with all the materials I'll need for that activity. Um, any graphic organizers or instructional strategies, graphic organizers that lend themselves to that activity are embedded and included in there for you um, as clickables for you to print print on, use digitally, or, um, or print hard copies for yourself or your students. And then we really walk you through some nice, concise implementation steps um, to take your students through these learning activities. One thing I really want to stress is that all of these learning activities um, are designed with the notion of active participation, active learning in mind. Um, you're really not going to find any activities that are drill and practice or sit and get model. Um, these are really active, uh, active participation in student learning. So if I were to click into activity five, I'm going to see um, a historical figure time capsule um, activity. And in this activity, there is a supplemental resource uh, that goes along with this mini on biographies. And in this, students can actually pick a figure to research and come up with four items that really capture the key moments or achievements in their figure's life. So if we actually navigate to the next screen, I want to show you this handout that comes with this activity a little bit more um, closely. In this activity, students can either write about these items or draw them. The handout works great for both options and nicely provides that choice for students. Whenever possible, we're always trying to give our students that choice, their flexibility. We know that studies show they're more engaged when they have um, the option to choose a, a, a particular path. But you can also see the handout is scaffolded really well with this first side that you're viewing here, laid out more like a graphic organizer to support students' organization and thinking. And the second side, provides really more open-ended reflection questions, which I know is a priority that some, someone mentioned earlier in our chat. Um, these reflection questions really tap into that upper level critical thinking metacognitive piece for our students. So they're scaffolded really beautifully. Um, in addition, what's also really great, like all of our supplemental resources, whether they're instructional strategies or organizers or other minis, um, is that teachers have a lot of flexibility in how they choose to use this handout what I like to call putting their own teacher spin on it. Um, so for example, they might put it up on their Promethean or smart board to walk through their thinking process with the class, showing students how to use meaningful items and explain why they would put these on the graphic organizer, why they matter, or they might share the handout with students either digitally as a printout included in all the activities. We offer a multitude of differentiation and variation on um, our ideas, on our handouts, so that you can quickly and easily adapt the activity to fit the particular needs of your students or their preferred learning style. Um, so again, this is just one of the four activities in that lesson mini on biographies, but I would definitely invite you to explore some of the other activities um, that align with your desired learning objectives or your desired learning outcomes um, for, your, for your age group. There's lots of great minis to explore with really nice printables um, and supplemental resources. Did I miss anything on that, Chris? No, that was incredibly comprehensive and <laughs> beautifully, beautifully put. Um, so just to kind of walk through this, um, you know, like Christy said, this can really be used as a nice way to kind of introduce some of the concepts that you're teaching in these early grades here. Um, so as we walk through these pieces here, 
right? We're, we're giving students ownership so they can go ahead, they can use, you know, their, their words, right? If they're, if they're capable of expressing themselves written, um, they can go ahead and say, oh, George Washington spent a lot of time on his family's farm when he was a kid. He loved being outdoors and learned about hard work by helping on the farm. Notice there's nothing here about cherry trees. I know that that's kind of a piece of um, Americana that I think has been widely debunked. The whole, I cannot tell a lie, I chopped down the cherry tree. Um, but again, trying to really tie into kind of some important events here. Um, achievement, George Washington made history by becoming America's first president, drawing a nice number one there. Um, we have a wooden gavel that shows how Washington was a strong leader who made important decisions as the president. Um, I don't know about, I don't, everyone's probably moved past it, but I'm still very much in like a Hamilton phase um, where we we listened to Hamilton on a long road trip that my family had a couple of weeks ago. Um, so I'm just like going through all of those George Washington songs in my head. Um, that's neither here nor there. Again, I told you I go off on, on tangents, my apologies. Um, and last event here, right? George Washington had to lead the army in a tough war to win America's freedom, even though it was very hard and they didn't have much money. Um, and then as Christy mentioned, the second side of this here, right? Provides some opportunities for reflection. Um, and again, you can put your own spin on it. You can have kids use these spaces as more of a visual piece. Um, you know, it's a little bit larger box. You could even have them do kind of like an image collage or something that represents that. Um, and really giving students ownership of, of their learning. As Christy said, right, research shows if they have ownership over their learning, it's really going to internalize much better for them. Um, so here we chose kind of a written option here. Um, so why did you choose to put these events in the time capsule and just kind of explain that? Uh, this is why we, we did all of that. Um, and then what do you think people in the future would learn about your historical figure from these items? Um, so again, the wooden gavel really explaining the um, the those pieces that they put into the time capsule. Um, but I, I, I like this activity, not just as a social studies teacher um, who, who likes to talk about history, but also as a way of really making that come alive, right? Giving students the opportunity to, you know, think about a time capsule. They may have seen a time capsule. Um, they may have seen that referenced in, in media. They may have seen it referenced in shows. Um, they may have been a part of one. I remember when I was a kid, I think our our church had a you know big event where they put a bunch of stuff in a time capsule and then sealed it into the side of the building. Um, and I just remember being really disappointed that I don't think I'm going to be alive when this is opened. <laughs> so having that conversation as well, this is, you know, maybe again, I tend to go down uh, dark examples sometimes, but um, I, I really like this one here. I, I want to open things up. Is there any feedback questions from folks? Christy, any additional context to, to add to the worked example here? No, I just love hearing the different thinking too, Chris, because as you're speaking, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, as a um, putting another teacher spin on it, I, I might want to take those reflection questions and have that be either an exit ticket for that activity, you know, cut that section off or um, a starter for the next day to re-engage in that activity. Um, another fun variation could be having the uh, time capsule pre-filled um, about with items of historical figures that you've already researched as a class and kind of do a, a little reverse model where you pull out um, specific items and have the students kind of predict who they think they belong to. So lots of great, great activities and lots of great spins to put on this one. Well, and I like that too. I like the way that you frame it, like things that can be pulled out of this because one of the questions that was asked in the Q&A while you were explaining this activity was, we see the time suggested here. Is this for the entire lesson mini or for an individual activity? And it's the, that suggested pacing is built for the individual activities, but also we want to make it really flexible, right? So if, you know, as you're going through lesson minis, if, if you like a particular graphic organizer, but you're like, I don't necessarily have 40 plus minutes to engage this, you can also put that spin on it, right? And 
you know, shorten things. Oh, maybe we've already covered some of the background knowledge in class. And so we can just use the, the graphic organizers or the worksheets. Um, so we want it to be as flexible as possible. Um, really, you know, knowing that everyone has different priorities, everyone has different needs in the classroom. Um, so really pull out the, the pieces that work for you. Um, and if you have feedback on how these are used, we are always welcome to that as well. Um, you can always reach out to our team um, if you have, you know, requests for additional content, um, feedback on kind of how things have have been used in your classroom. Um, we are certainly open to any and all feedback that that folks have because we want to make this resource as user friendly, as easy to use as possible. So, please let us let us know what we can do to improve. Um, like I said, this brand new. We, we know that, you know, we're constantly going to be adding to this as well. All right. Um, I know we're at 1032 a.m. Central Time, so we can really quickly, I think, go through this uh, middle example here, Christy, and then we'll jump into our final kind of feedback loop and action steps at the end. Sure. I'll try and be um, quick on this one, but I have to say, guys, this is probably a personal favorite um, as a former middle school teacher. You know, the ability for this mini um, taking notes and citing sources, this mini can be so beneficial for our middle school students, even el early elementary um, and high school students. It walks them through four different ways to take notes and to cite sources. Um, and the one that I'd love to highlight for you in particular is activity four, which is on um, visual note taking, or some of us know it as sketch noting, which it can be a really powerful um, note-taking strategy for our students. So it, it walks through kind of the same steps of implementation. Um, you can see the text message display where we're speaking in middle school student language and they are kind of um, helping us translate, if you will, um, a conversation between two friends using emojis, which is sort of the language that they speak right now. Um, and then it also supports with a visual note-taking graphic organizer. Um, and I really like to think of the visual note taking as a way to bring those abstract concepts to life through simple drawings and symbols. I'm a very visual learner um, and it's it's really about giving students another way to process what they're learning. As I said, as a former middle school teacher, I found that when students combine their quick sketches and words, it helps them organize them spatially on the page and sort of move from that passive um, passive note taking to more active note taking, making it more uh, personalized and it really helps that information stick. Um, as I said, it's it's really one of my favorite lesson minis. Um, I would strongly encourage you to go through and, and look at this one. It's nice because it introduces students to the four different styles of note taking um, and allows them the opportunity to explore which would work best for them and then potentially transfer that to future activities. Um, as we know, those note taking skills are transferable across content areas. So I know your colleagues will thank you and their future teachers will too, for sure. Awesome. Yeah, I think and and one of the things that this makes me think of is, you know, that that long battle, I think, that has been waged in the education space on you know, graphic or um, graphic novels. And, you know, can we use that as an instructional pieces? And um, I do like the idea of kind of meeting students uh, where they are, right? And and making these, you know, experiences authentic to them. Um, so I do, I do really like this one as well, Christy. Um, so I want to pause here and again, open things back up in the chat. Um, and just get some kind of quick feedback. Um, going back to what we spoke about, the different uh, priorities that we discuss. Do you feel that these two examples that we shared here uh, connect to your priorities? And obviously we're just scratching the surface here of, of what's available in Teach Britannica uh, with the lesson minis. But I, I just wanna get some quick feedback. Um, so please in the chat, just let us know how these examples connect to your priorities. Um, and, and how this could, how you could see these being implemented in the classroom as well. Mm 
I see that someone mentioned that although their content area um, is science, they actually never thought that they could teach um, different note-taking strategies to their students. And I think that's a great point. I was a world language teacher, um, and that was often a skill that I didn't incorporate very readily into my, my classroom, but certainly can, given the, the structure and the support of these minis. Thanks. Yeah, and I think, you know, especially as we look at the instructional strategies too, I think we, and and again, shameless plug for some of our upcoming sessions here, um, but it really does take that cross-curricular approach, right? So having the ability to kind of teach these skills, but then not sacrifice your content as well, um, and really kind of build these types of skills into an engaging activity that also meets your curriculum needs. Um, so I think trying to, you know, save time, save energy, uh, make it as easy as possible for, for teachers here. Um, I see a question in the Q&A. So it says, is Teach Britannica plan to be constantly updated in terms of more lesson minis, um, like the updates in the articles presented in Britannica School? Um, so Christy, I'll let you field that question there. Yeah, a big yes to that question. We're really excited to share some more minis. Um, the minis that you'll see presented in Teach Britannica to start um, are associated with our, our kind of bigger articles, our, our high topics that are often searched. We wanted to make sure that we're providing teachers with additional material for those so that when they came back to our trusted resource this year, they were presented with some um, new activities for those, but we'll be rolling out some additional minis and some additional instructional strategies and graphic organizers on a monthly basis. Um, and so that's where we'd love to hear your feedback. If there's um, particular minis that you would love to see, um, let us know. For sure, we'll take that into account in, in our design. Uh, as Chris mentioned earlier, you can expect some high school minis coming soon, focused primarily on the research uh, process, which is really uh, exciting. And we're we're really excited to have those come to you uh, in a few weeks. Awesome. And see some other comments here as a librarian, you can see using these to reinforce what the classroom teachers are covering. Um, absolutely. I feel like these can be, you know, the, the more that we can connect those strands across different core subjects, right, and having those kind of interdisciplinary lessons, um, absolutely, the more students are going to really internalize that information. Um, Prague is saying different examples that align closely with your priorities. Um, using lesson minis with organized activities for focused instruction, participation, reinforcing key concepts. Um, lots, yeah, lots of, of really good, flexible ways to, to implement this and definitely appreciate that feedback as well. One thing right. we didn't mention. Oh, sorry, Chris, I, go ahead. Yeah, and I have to say, Chris, you're probably tired of me saying this, but one thing we didn't say yet was um, all lesson minis, we're really proud to offer that um, a co-teaching support or collaborative teaching support in each of our activities. Um, you know, and so oftentimes when resources are made for classrooms, we think of a general ed classroom in mind and sort of designed to that. But with our collaborative teaching, we look at the six models of co-teaching and really identify the strategy that best aligned with that learning activity. And we really identify for you what the role is of each teacher in that classroom, whether it's the gen ed teacher or the special ed teacher, so that both are playing an active role um, in that lesson. And um, that's something we're really, really proud to offer in, in each and every activity. Yeah, I presented this at a conference a couple of weeks ago. And when I got to that team teaching section, as I was demoing, um, one of the people in the room audibly gasped when she saw that and was like, this is awesome. Like it, it just meets that need so perfectly. So um, again, shameless plug for, uh, and, and kudos to, to Christy and, and the team for developing, I think such a engaging resource here. Um, all right. So few minutes left, I promise I will, I will wrap things up here. Um, so just a, a call for action here. Um, and, and we'll just jump into our, our action steps because I know we're, we're almost out of time here. So uh, next steps for all of our attendees, if you can join us in these action steps here. Uh, the first is to bookmark Teach Britannica for easy access. So it's teachbritannica.com. Um, just really simple, again, open access, no firewall, no paywall, um, open to, to all educators 
um, but again, pairs really well with our Britannica content. Um, I would also ask if you can find maybe one new resource type before our next webinar. Uh, again, we'll be hosting a um, session next Tuesday uh, about Britannica Library and strengthening library programs. Um, so if you can find one new resource that works for you within the next week, and then, oh, wrong button there. Um, and then finally, share successful implementations with colleagues. So as you start to incorporate Teach Britannica, um, we kind of rely on word of mouth. So kind of be our, our Teach Britannica evangelist to make sure that we're really letting other folks know that this resource is checking in to make sure that you've done these three steps. But uh, if you can join us in these, that would be wonderful. All right, just to wrap up here, um, and Christy put a link in the chat here, a link directly to the lesson minis. Um, as we mentioned, we have these tied to early elementary, elementary and middle school, um, but you will start to see these in high school and in other formats as well. And just to kind of, again, plug our, our remaining uh, webinars here. If you liked what you saw today, you can join Christy and I next week to revitalize library programs with Teach Britannica. It's really built for the public library space. Uh, November 5th at 10 a.m. Central, we have our cross-curricular learning where we'll talk about resources that tie to many different Britannica products. And then November 12th, Boost Student Research with Teach Britannica Toolkits. That's really built for the higher ed space. Um, so if you have questions about, I know there was a question in the chat about um, universities. Um, so please you know, feel free to share that widely as well. Uh, we didn't talk about academic toolkits today. So they do pair really well with Britannica Academic, um, but they're really built around kind of building student research skills as well. Um, so as Christy said, please share, please bring a friend. Um, we're, we're more than happy, the more the merrier uh, to join our upcoming sessions here. So two minutes left. I know we've had some really good engagement here in the chat. So if you do have any questions, Christy and I will stick around for a little bit longer, um, but I will go ahead and put our closing slide here. Um, thank you so much for everyone who attended today. Really appreciate your insightful feedback. Um, and we look forward to seeing you on future sessions as well. So thank you very much. And I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone.